Hey everybody, welcome to Invested. I'm Danielle Town. One from the vault this week. I looked back and this one's from 2019. It's on a subject that I think is maybe the most important concept to understand when it comes to long-term value investing. And that is, what is an investment and what is a speculation, a risky, not sure what's going to happen choice? If you can know these two things for yourself, if I can know what is something I'm deeply confident in versus something that I'm consciously putting money in as a risk, then to me that makes my investing safe, safer, as safe as it can be because I'm conscious of my choices. It's something my dad and I always seem to debate on and I'm not really sure why because we end up in the same place every time which is roughly agreeing with each other, but I don't know. It's a funny one. So I thought I'd play it for you guys today. It's from 2019. And it's actually part of our series where we took questions from our listeners and uh, and tried to answer them quickly and basically failed at quickly answering them. But it always led to lots of interesting discussions. So that's our quick questions series, which we should probably bring back because you guys have the best questions. So enjoy and Think about investing versus speculating in your own investing practice. I know I am. And uh, have a great week. Thanks, everybody. Hopefully, we'll be back next week. Enjoy. Hey, everybody. This is Phil Town. And this is Danielle Town. And welcome to the Invested Podcast, where we are learning to invest like Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, other great investors in this ruler tradition, rule one tradition, meaning a tradition of investors who focus deeply on not losing money. And Mm -hmm. that focus means that they are after wonderful businesses that will be around for a long, long time. And they want to buy them at a discount to their value. And that combination produces low risk, high returns, which are thought to be unicorns by the (laughs) Securities Exchange Commission and all of the professors in not all, but almost all the professors in universities around the world who believe in efficient market theory, saying that no one can beat the market. Therefore, high returns without high risk are impossible. And we just have experience and that that's just not true. So Well, and the great part is that as this market is so nuts and going up and down and responding to every piece of tiny news that happens, especially regarding the trade war that's going on, we kind of get to just, I don't know, what are you doing? I mean, I'm just sort of sitting here being like, that's happening out there. It's separate from me. I don't it really is, have to pay attention. It is separate out there. And and of course, a lot of that depends on how comfortable you are um, with your current portfolio. And I'm extremely comfortable with mine right now. I'm, well, isn't that the whole point is to create a portfolio that you're extremely comfortable with? It is. And by the way, that portfolio can include quite a lot of cash, which <laughs> yeah. is in fact Warren Buffett's prescription for markets that are about to experience gigantic storms and rain, you know, rain. He, he basically says, look, every 10 years or so we have an economic storm. And when we have an economic storm, it's going to rain and it's going to rain gold, meaning wonderful businesses are going to go on sale. And he said, when that happens, when it's raining gold, you need to go outside with a wash bucket, not a teaspoon. And the point of that is that a wash bucket, of course, is a pile of cash and a teaspoon is a little bit of cash. And if you stay in the market and you don't have cash available to you when it starts to have an economic storm, then you're going outside with a teaspoon, right? Dollar cost averaging your way into the next, you know, market, whatever it is, with your teaspoon that you've got for the last two weeks of earnings. And you're not going to benefit from this enormous opportunity. So the real controversial thing to say about this style of investing is that in this sort of a market, really good investors in this style of investing are stacking up cash. Buffett reportedly has 140 billion right now stacked up in cash. Yeah, well, it's hard to do if you're already in the market. And we've done a bunch of episodes already about that situation. But yes, if you have the choice, then yeah, stack up well, the cash. Well, if you're already in the market, you might want to consider not being in the market. So let's talk about the difference <laughs> here between somebody who's an investor in this way and what that means 
and a mm-hmm. speculator because we are doing a new thing, guys, that we're calling Quick Questions on Invested. And what we have is if you go to investedpodcast.com, you can leave us a voicemail, essentially, a voice message. There's a little tiny bar over on the right side of the website that it takes you to. And it says, um, let me look at it. It says, ask invested anything. And if you click on that, you can record a voice message for us. And so we've gotten a bunch of them already without us even announcing it. So thanks, you guys, for checking them out. And I'm going to play our first one, which is from Paul, who lives in Switzerland. And I will say in advance, he didn't actually ask a question. He just left us a really nice message, which, yes, we're going to shamelessly play because we love it so much. Um, but I think there is actually some good stuff to talk about from uh, from his comments. Ready, Dad? I am. I'm really excited to, to do this. Um, I just want to say... Um, Danielle made all this up on her own and, and this is, <laughs> I'm just hearing about it right now. This is, <laughs> all right, go ahead. He's like, Fire um, away. questions? Um, what? Okay. Here we okay. go. Hi, Phil and Danielle. I just wanted to say how much I really enjoy your show. Uh, my name is Paul and strangely enough, um, actually I live very close to where Danielle lives. I live in Volarau in Switzerland, only about uh, 10 minutes outside of uh, Zurich. I listen to your show while I'm commuting back and forth to work, and I think you do a really, really good job. I enjoyed your Tesla episode very, very much, and I think your definitions between speculation and investing are fantastic. I get the impression that a lot of investors get so emotionally involved, they start cheering on their stocks like their favorite football team, and that's not what investing is about. Anyway, I just wanted to say how much I enjoy your show and how much I felt like I've learned and keep up the good work. Bye. So that was nice. Just a shameless, Thank you, Paul. That was a shameless plug. Yeah. There was not even a question there. I'm starting out quick questions <laughs> with nothing but accolades from Paul. <laughs> That's Well, first, I want to thank Paul for, um, at an absolute minimum, telling me how to say Zurich properly. <laughs> Oh, there's a story there, Dad. Different uh, people say the ich or ish different ways. I just went. <laughs> <laughs> but but I wanted to play that one because I loved Paul's comment about how to him investing is not about cheering on companies like your favorite football team. Because when I heard that, I actually listened to it a couple of times and debated if I actually agreed with that particular yeah I'm, I'm having i'm having some uh uh wayward thoughts <laughs> with re- i mean intellectually yeah but in practically speaking i buy companies that i really am cheering on i mean i mean I'm, me too like go baby go i want to see you in the world i want to see more of you in the world and i'm expecting you to be around being bigger and better than ever for the next decade or more so oh yeah now I think what he probably would agree with is that we can be emotionally connected all we want to as long as we stay objective about the story going on there. Yeah, I think what he's meaning by that is complete love, irrational love based on like, right, based on like childhood (laughs) dreams. (laughs) Um, Blind. Yeah, totally blind. And I think that's right. I think people who... Um, are more on the speculative side, don't have that great underpinning of understanding of what they really own. It's totally more of like a greater fool, like pray to the gods that the kick goes in kind of situation. (laughs) Right. And and we do want, I mean, basically we want to be absolutely rational about the whole thing. So while we're cheering on our company, we're cheering it on because rationally it's a great company a wonderful business run by people with great integrity. And you know, why, why wouldn't you cheer that on into the world if it matches your values? And yet you must be prepared to stay up on this thing rationally And understand that, oh, this has now changed. You know, they've changed the CEO. These people are taking this in a new direction. Mm -hmm. 
um, or now they're lying to us or some, something has radically changed in that business. And then the love affair has to end. And so y- yes. you, you, you can't, you can't get that emotionally tied up that you can't disconnect if things have changed. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's right. You can't get so emotionally tied up. That's a good way to put it. And at the same time, for me, a huge, maybe like most of the joy of investing practice is falling in love, is cheering on the company and feeling really excited about being part of what they're doing by owning them. Like that makes me so happy. I mean, I have loved my companies and God, when I've like, when Whole Foods got sold to Amazon, I truly was grieving for a couple of days. And I consciously was like, first of all, I was like, I don't know what's happening to me. And then I realized that I was going through deep sadness. And then I thought that's crazy. And then I thought, you know what? I was really committed to this and this, this, I meant to be part of Whole Foods for the next 10 years and they've cut it off at whatever it was, a year or something that I only got to be part of it. And I felt really sad about that, even though I made a lot of money on that investment. So like the outcome was really good and yet I felt really sad and I decided just to let myself feel sad about it and feel like I was having a unfortunate divorce that I didn't want because that's kind of what was happening. I think that's, that's actually really helpful in, in the long term view of how to invest, um, requiring that you kind of hang in there with companies when they're going through some bumps and, and it takes a, it takes a commitment to the story that you've got there and, and you should feel like, oh man, I mean, I really relate to your feeling about getting taken out of Whole Foods prematurely um, on both levels. First, it's a wonderful business. And, and the second, what that means financially mm-hmm. as a wonderful business is that now you have to do the work to go replace that mm-hmm. wonderful business that's going to compound your money at a high rate of return for many years in the future. Now you don't have that in your portfolio anymore. You have to go replace it. And that's not the easiest thing in the world to do. That's and so true. there's this other there's side that of it that too. says, oh man, no. Nah. Now I've got this hole and, uh, yeah, and I, there's I, that I, too. Yeah. But so I mean, those two things kind of go together. I think it's also kind of, maybe I'm like, maybe I'm, I'm curious what you think. Maybe I'm too much on the like identity side of it. And maybe I should be more like Paul and be a little more logical, you know, or not. I think I'm plenty logical, I don't but think those things are, they, those no, two no, things that's are what, yeah, I was using the wrong word, but just, um, a little more separated maybe. But frankly, since that happened, since Amazon bought Whole Foods, I've been, I mean, part of it is I don't live in the U.S. anymore, so I don't have Whole Foods around the corner, but I used to get so excited just to go to a Whole Foods, even when I was visiting. And now that I'm not an owner anymore, I just don't feel that connected to those stores. And I don't feel like I really, and I've actually had the thought, I was just in New York and I thought, oh, I should go to Whole Foods and check on it. Because that's how I used to think about it, like check on my company. And, and then I was like, eh, why? I don't really need to. <laughs> I totally get that. <laughs> I, I'm in the process right now of buying into a company pretty, pretty aggressively. Okay. I'm not going to ask I'm not going to mention what it is, of course, because I want the price to go down. <laughs> I want it to go down a lot from where it is right now. And so the last thing I want to do is put it out there, what I'm doing, uh, because we, we actually have a lot of fans here and you guys jump in there. The price can go up. So I want this thing to go down. So I'm not going to talk about it. But as I'm now acquiring pieces of it, I am absolutely being pulled emotionally yeah. to participate in this company's products. In some yeah, kind it's of that way. tiptoeing into it that you've talked about. Yeah. It's almost like the leaving it is the opposite of your tiptoeing out of it. <laughs> and you start right. to disconnect. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that weird? I mean, it's, yeah. I never thought about that that much before, but when you mentioned it, I started to think, oh yeah, I'm thinking about going over there. I'm thinking about doing things there. I'm thinking about this and that. And it, and, and only because I'm now an owner, even mm-hmm. in a small way. Right. Mm-hmm. So I think that definitely the opposite of that would happen. If you, you're now no longer an owner, then you're 
you're basically coming out. You're coming out all the ways there are to come out of it. And I think that's instructive for this time now in the market as where we started of like saying, you know, if you're in cash, then great. But if you're not and you are stuck in companies, I think this up and down is very instructive as to whether or not that is a company that you love or it's a company that you don't love and you don't really feel totally comfortable sitting through these ups and these downs, right? Like if you were totally good with it, you'd be like, eh, it's fine. I'll check it in, you know, next earnings report, whatever. Like it's going to like the price doesn't matter. I know what I own, you know? Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a hundred percent with you. I, except that I'm, I'm not feeling stuck in anything. No, I'm and, saying for people who are, because we definitely know, have a lot of listeners st- who own a lot of stocks from like before they started listening to us, from before they started understanding the difference between investing and speculating and have been have been figuring out, you know, what what do we do with this portfolio that we've got? Well, yeah, that's that's always the question. But is there really a kind of a I'm stuck in it? Or is it I'm I'm in it and I haven't made I don't know enough yet to make a decision about whether yeah, I, need, that's true. I should still be in that's it. That's true. Those are two different things. That's a good point. Well, I would get rolling on the, these decisions, you guys, real quick because I think we're rolling up on um, on obviously what what our president is trying to avoid using the bully pulpit and the bully Twitter as he's as trying much to avoid using that. <laughs> No, he's trying to avoid a recession <laughs> before the election because if he has a recession, he's not going to get reelected. Yeah, he that's knows for it. Sure. So yeah. he's pounding on the Federal Reserve, and not not to say he's wrong, um, but he's pounding, and um, and all the pounding in the world, and in fact, the willingness of the Federal Reserve to go along with the pounding, and I think they will, um, indicates that things are not lovely out there. And if you're in Europe, you already know things are not lovely out there. Definitely, um, we have negative yeah. interest rates. In Europe. Get Negative. that, folks. If you don't even know what that means, it means that if you lend your money to the German government, they will not give you back your money and interest. They will not even give you back your money altogether. They're going to give you back about 99% of your money 10 it, years from now. I don't even understand how that is pot. Like, it's just, I, I get that it's a thing that happens, but how... That, How would it, good investors decide to put their money into, like, knowledgeable people into a negative interest rate? How would that happen? And the answer is they think it's going to get worse. And therefore, if you have, uh, let's say you put your money into a 10-year bond, the Bund, let's say, in Germany, mm-hmm. and um, you put in $100,000, you know you're going to get back $99,000. But in the future, the new Bund is being sold at $75,000 return, just to take a ridiculous number here. 75000 is what you get back. You put your money to the federal government, 10 years later, you get back 75000 That makes the $99,000 boon really valuable. It well, just went up. I mean, nobody has to put their money into that at all. So actually what must be happening is that any other options must be quite bad. Like or scary. Inflation going nuts or... Uh, well, the other the what? other options are typically uh, from bonds are stocks, and mm-hmm. there is a there if there's a wide recognition among institutional investors that there's going to be a, or already is started a big recession coming in Europe, um, they know the stock market's going down, and so they are shifting their portfolios to offset that risk, and they would rather have. Um, the oper- and, and as I said, they think that bonds are going down as well, which I think they're right. I don't know how much more they'll go down below negative, but I think the United States at 1.5% on a T-bill is likely to go down. If we have a recession, they're going to shove it down. Mm-hmm. And so people are jumping into things that will benefit from that thing going down. And one of those things is bonds at the current price. Hmm. And they're safer than stocks. So... You know, some money, you know, most of your money back versus half of your money back in 10 years, right? Hmm. If you put your money in the stock market or, as we say, you're stuck in the market because you haven't learned enough to to make a determination of whether you're in a great company and it's on sale and it's a good price or whether you're willing to stay in it even if it's not quite on sale. 
if you can't make those decisions right now, you could get caught. And in, in five years, you could have half the money you've got right now. And the markets may be very slow to return. So that's that's the judgment going on out there. And of course, most of the people who are making those decisions are very short term investors. They're looking at a year as a long time. Yeah, yeah. And, and so I wouldn't, uh, you know, that's not how we go, basically, is what I'm saying. It's not how we invest. But we certainly have to pay attention to it. And, um, you know, the risk of sitting in the stock market right now, I think, is a significant risk. If you are not, uh, if you're 50 or 5 or 60 years old, I mean, or 65 or 70 even more exacerbates the problem. And that is that you know darn well from having lived through a few of these things in your lifetime that the market goes down. And when it goes down, it can take years before it comes back to where it is today. Mm -hmm. And therefore, people who take their money off the table at the right time benefit dramatically because you well, can buy back those same companies Easier much said cheaper. than done. <laughs> Well, this is where I get laughed at all the time on TV, and now you're laughing at me. Well, yeah. It's, oh, the people <laughs> who take their money off the table at the right time do well? Really? Really? Yeah. You sure? Yeah. Hmm. I, <laughs> all right. I had the head of Kiplinger Magazine laughing at me on CNBC, and come on. He's basically going, oh, come on. You know, hey, Maria, have Phil call me when we, when we get to the bottom, okay? So, yeah. But you know what? Buffett's made a bunch of really good calls over his lifetime. So have I. It's not impossible. It it just realize you just have to realize that if you're going to exit the market, uh, you're likely exiting too soon. It's likely to go up from where you are. But if you've made a good judgment on on the fundamentals that are there, you know, eventually it, it does come around. Yeah, and eventually. We, I mean, how hard is this right now? We've been in a bull market for ten years. Yeah. 10 years. Yeah. We have never gone this long without a recession. Europe is going into recession. China is sliding down in its growth rate dramatically. Mm -hmm. Come on. I mean, interest rates are going to zero for a reason. People are scared. This is just a gigantic bunch of red flags floating around out there. It's not that genius to say, maybe I should get to something a little safer well, than sitting in the stock market right now. And I think it could pop back up and keep going for another few years. I think that's completely feasible. Oh, and I, then, I agree. Yeah. And then everybody who took their money out is going to be like, ah, uh, what the heck? I know. Well, hey, listen, uh, as someone who has that emotion crop up on a regular basis, oh, the, uh, uh, individual companies, the, uh, <laughs> right? I mean, I've just done it to myself again on Chipotle, right? <laughs> just to bring back, back, back in uh, 2009, got into Chipotle and wrote it up. And got out, and then it continued to go up another 50%. And then I've just done the same thing, right? Gotten out, and it's continued to rocket straight up. So I have a nasty tendency to exit these things uh, well before their top in these kinds of markets. But on the other hand, you know... It's the conservative it, it's the, choice. It's the conservative choice, and it's the discipline. And, you know, I don't I don't like the feeling of losing money. I, I, I don't like the feeling of leaving money on the table, but I like it a lot better than losing money. Mm -hmm. And um, in the long run, that preserves those high rates of return. So I think, you know, it's a it's obviously getting out is a double edged sword. You can get out too soon. You can get out too late. And and getting out too late is just the worst because you, you the market's going down, the market's going down, the market's going down. And about the time you think, yeah, I, I'm going to get out now, you know, according to the emotional rule of investing, <laughs> that the moment you exit the market, it goes straight up for the next 10 years. <laughs> so, so being early is way better emotionally than being late. And if I have to, if I have to ride through a couple more years of nothing but up, um, you know, I'm still out there looking for great companies that are on sale. I stay with that discipline. And as I just said, I'm buying a company now, mm -hmm. you know, and um, it's just that, I have a lot of trouble filling out the entire portfolio right now. It's it's I'm gonna I'm gonna be in cash just if for no other reason than I don't know what to buy. Um, if I'm focused on my rules, which are wonderful business, yeah, there's a bunch of them on my list. On sale, not really, not at all. Yeah, that's yeah. that's the catch. Yeah, I mean, shoot, I'll give you one to go look at. I'd I'd go buy Sherman Williams in a heartbeat. Right, they're terrific paint company, and. The trouble is they're priced at four times what the margin of safety is, double what they're worth. But 
heck, man, if you've got investors out there who are happy to just get anything of a return, they'll pay that stuff for companies. Mm -hmm. Eventually, it turns out that that's not a great way to make money. Great way to preserve money. I mean, you're going to preserve your wealth. But many of the people on this podcast that we're talking, uh, who are listening right now, are trying to make money. They're trying to get into a position where they're financially secure and have the freedom that that brings to do the things you want to do in your life. And man, alive, if you keep doing it that old way, you're just not going to, you're not going to get there. Not in this market, not where we are right now. So that's just to come back to our theme, investing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's investing. Yeah. Speculating is what you're all doing. If you're sitting there in stocks and you don't know what they're worth, or you've got indexes and mutual funds and ETFs, and you're praying that they go up, you're not an investor in spite of the financial services industry loving to call you that. They love to call you an investor because it makes you feel good and you leave your money with them. If they were to call you what you are, oh, you're a gambling speculator. You might think you're twice a about giving fan, them your as money. Paul put it. I love it. I'm going to think about that fan. from now on. You're a football fan. <laughs> you're a football fan. You're you're cheering on their home team, yeah. right? Oh, I've got the money in the U.S. indexes. I'm cheering on the team. Or I'm in the world indexes. I'm cheering on the team. Look how positive I am about go Lions. But you know what? That's not a great way to be wealthy. Mm. Not a great way to get there in any case. Well, so, this has been quick bad. questions. We're going to look forward to more quick questions that are actually questions. <laughs> now that I know we're doing this, I guess you guys shoot the questions in and we will we'll take a, we'll take one each each time. Is that how we're playing this game? No, we're playing this game like we'll take one when we feel like it. As usual. <laughs> how do we do anything on this show? It's when we feel like it. Oh, you guys, I apologize. It's just the way things are. <laughs> and until next time, it's time to go play. Thanks, See everybody. Ya. And good luck this week with the market volatility. I know it's tough. Okay. <laughs> Bye. So. Hi, guys. Thanks for listening to Invested. If you enjoyed this episode and you want more information or to listen to additional episodes, visit our website at investedpodcast.com and sign up for my virtual workshop right there. Spots are definitely limited for this event. I'm not kidding. They really are. They sell out very quickly. So everything discussed on this podcast, by the way, is either my opinion or it's Danielle's opinion. And I'm really important. It's not to be taken as investing advice because I am not your financial advisor, nor have I considered your personal situation as your fiduciary. So remember that. You're on your own here. This podcast is for your entertainment and education only, and I really hope you enjoyed it.